Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure and a privilege to introduce Professor Tobias Reinhardt. Professor Reinhardt studied history and philosophy in Hamburg and Rome and received his PhD in Hanover on the topic of law and rationality in early Greece. Uh, he worked for several years at the DFG Graduate College on the program called Slavery, Serfdom and Compulsory Labor, Forced Labor, Unfree Work and Life from Antiquity to the 20th Century at the University of Trier. And his Cabilitation Treatise, the individual in Greek political philosophy was accepted by the same university. Uh, Professor Reichardt then left the university and is currently working at the private sector, so he's basically a living proof that there is life beyond academia. Uh, he's working at the private sector in the fields of uh, further and professional education. Uh, however, he still continues teaching philosophy uh, on occasion at the University of Trier. Uh, his research interests include Marx and critical theory, and his most recent publication is a book, Leaving Capitalism, The Economy of a Society in, in Transition, uh, published in German last year. I will not attempt to read this in German because I think it would do social injustice to define <laughs> German language. Uh, his talk today is entitled uh, Equality as an Ideal that Transcends Capitalism, the Critique of the Frankfurt School. Uh, the talk will last some half an hour, followed by uh, 20 something minutes of discussion and ending with, uh, I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear, early coffee break. So without further ado, uh, I welcome Professor Reinhardt. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've got to correct you a bit. I'm um, uh, not a professor. I've got the title of a so-called Privatdozent in Germany, uh, which means yeah, that I'm affiliated to the University of Trier and have to teach there. Uh, but working in different fields, as you said. OK. So, uh, equality as an ideal that transcends capitalism is my question. Um, and I want to speak mainly about the Frankfurt School first generation. The interest in the fundamental critique of capitalism has increased since the beginning of the world financial crisis in 2008. When first banks and states crumbled, it became obvious that the contemporary economic system was not made for eternity. It creates problems it apparently cannot solve. To many, the quest for a different economic system seems more important than ever. In this context, the question of inequality has been raised by many authors and social movements. While conservative or liberal politicians and scholars defend inequality as a prerequisite of freedom, social development, and of economic growth, Left-wing thinkers often answer by arguing for more equality. But is this the necessary conclusion? Is the ideal of equality able to criticize and potentially overcome capitalism? Well, there are critics of capitalism who at the same time hold a critical view of the ideal of equality. As I will put forward, Marx already showed that the capitalist system is based on a combination of equality and inequality. The simple call for more equality will not lead us out of the system. At the most, it will reproduce it on a higher level. The Frankfurt School's critique of equality went even further. Under the impression of fascism, Horkheim and Adorno came to see the ideal of equality mainly as a call for conformity and social constraint. But let me begin with Marx. We can find a critique of the ideal of equality already in Marx. According to the author of Capital, equality belongs to the surface of the capitalist system. It is ideology as well as a necessary dimension of capitalist society. We are, in fact, all equal as contractual partners on the market. We heard about that before. This equality in the exchange is expressed and made possible by the equality before the law. But this dimension of equality is perfectly in harmony with social domination. The freedom and equality in the sphere of circulation is just the medium through which class division between those who possess the means of production and those who possess only their labor power reproduces itself. A person who has only a little bit of money can still feel like a king in the role of a customer.
Um, this might be an illusion, but at least there's some kernel of truth in it. When it comes to the labor contract, the illusion is still getting thinner. Of course, the owner of labor power has got rights and is free to agree to the contract or not. But this kind of equality is merely formal. The positions of the owner of a company and the owner of, a, of labor power are clearly not equal. The owner of labor power is forced to sell his commodity and must more or less accept the conditions he or she meets. And the first volume of Capital, Marx ironically says about the sphere of circulation, I quote, this sphere that we are deserting, within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on, is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. There alone rule freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. By Bentham, he means utility. Freedom because both buyer and seller of a commodity, say of labor power, are constrained only by their own free will. They contract as free agents, and the agreement they come to is but the form in which they give legal expression to the common will. Equality because each enters into relation with the other, as with the simple owner of commodities, and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. End of quotation. So, in a developed capitalist society, on a certain level, all people are equal. In fact, equality is an essential element of the capitalist system and its strength. That is why Marx calls capital a leveler, a system which makes people equal. Capital is by nature a leveler because it demands equal conditions of exploitation in all spheres of production as its innate human right. End of quotation. Capital demands equality. It demands that all spheres of society are equally open to investment, that all members of society, male or female, are equally capable of being engaged in the process of production. Capital will accept no limits of producing value, no limits dictated by tradition or law. There is an important reason why women in the Western world today have left the domestic sphere and entered the world of business. And of course, everybody, whatever may be his or her color or gender, is welcome as a customer. Fundamental inequality between people based on law or tradition in the long run appears as a foreign element in the capitalist system and will be abolished. Surely, this leveling which modern society has brought about was a historical progress. The freedom from traditional ties is something we, as emancipatory thinkers, will be thankful for and something we want to preserve. No one would exchange this capitalist freedom and equality against a traditional hierarchy encountered still today in considerable parts of the world. Marx, too, rec recognized this progressive aspect of capitalism. The description of the dissolution of tra traditional privileges, which we read in the Communist Manifesto, is not without admiration. The bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. Nevertheless, we should not forget that this formal equality is an equality under coercion. We all have to subdue to the market. Somebody who does not fulfill the standards which are expected by society and especially by business because he or she does not have the capabilities or because he or she deliberately chooses a different way of life will face considerable disadvantages. We have to work in the way society dictates, produce what the market demands and we have to study in the way the Bologna process prescribes. 
according to the requirements of business and the wishes of ministers of economic affairs. Notwithstanding all the variety modern societies allow, the basic conditions are the same for everybody. We live, work, study and compete under the same or similar conditions and standards. The goal of equality and individual liberty in capitalism is not the free development of the individual, but the production of value, of capital, of profit. The competition under, in theory, equal conditions presupposes inequality. Because society is divided in those who possess the means of production and the majority who possess only their labor power. And the result of this competition is, of course, inequality. The inequality of success, of income, of wealth, and of power is a result of the equality under capital, even if in reality this equality always has its deficiencies. Capitalist society presupposes and reproduces equality, conformity to the market, as well as inequality. Thus, equality is an element of capitalism, not its opposite. Some seemingly egalitarian measures in our society are in fact instruments through which capitalist domination makes its way. They eliminate everything which does not fit, everything which is a limit to making profit. In this respect, we can understand and apply Hegel's famous words, to establish abstractions in reality is to destroy reality. To establish equality can mean destroying variety, independence, individuality. Let me give you an example. If the same equal requirements of producing so-called employable persons for capitalist companies has to be fulfilled by all academic disciplines, this will destroy some of them, like philosophy, and it will change others fundamentally. More equality of income, of rights, more equality of opportunities in capitalism, desirable though they may be, will not remove the social hierarchies, but reproduce them. This certainly does not mean that we should reject egalitarian reforms, but it means that these reforms, as such, will never lead us out of the existence system of social domination. In fact, they might even strengthen and stabilize social domination. According to Marx, equal law will be maintained in the first stadium of a post-capitalist society. Uh, I'm referring to the critique of the Gotha program. But he continues, a law is always a law of inequality. It treats the unequal individuals in an equal manner. In so doing, it reproduces inequality, even in socialism. The principle of a hypothetical future communist society, therefore, would not be equality, but famous quotation, from each according to his ability to each uh, according to his needs. That was Marx. Now I'm turning to Adorno and Horkheimer. I'm convinced that the protagonists of the Frankfurt School basically share this Marxian view of equality in capitalism. And they go further. The impression of the individual is the prevailing topic in critical theory. At least in the original critical theory. Equality in some sense might be an instrument of the emancipation of the individual, but it is also used as an instrument of oppression. Emancipation in the eyes of Adorno and Horkheimer would not mainly consist in equality, but rather in the possibility to be different not to have to follow social norms. Bourgeois enlightenment, instead, is characterized by uniformity. Fascism, usually regarded as being opposed to liberalism and equality, becomes the result of bourgeois society based on equality and freedom. It is, quotation from the dialectic of the enlightenment, the triumph of repressive equality. Fascism is the triumph of repressive equality. 
Adorno concludes that a movement to overcome capitalism should not preserve equality as an ideal. It is too easy to integrate it into capitalism or to use it for defending conservative or even totalitarian policies. In this context, I would like to focus on two passages. The first one is taken from the first chapter, or so-called fragment, of the dialectic of the Enlightenment. Enlightenment, I would like to say bourgeois or capitalist enlightenment, is conceived here as a big equalizer. Enlightenment cuts off what is not reducible to the same measure. Not merely are qualities dissolved in thought, but human beings are forced into real conformity. The blessing that the market does not ask about birth is paid for in the exchange society by the fact that the possibilities conferred by birth are molded to fit the production of goods that can be bought on the market. Each human being has been endowed with a self of his or her own, different from all others, so that it could all the more surely be made the same. But because that self never quite fitted the mold, enlightenment throughout the liberalistic period has always sympathized with social coercion. End of quotation. This argument seems to me to be very close to Marx's theory. Equality in capitalism has always the aspect of coercion to conformity. What is going beyond the horizon of Marx is first the connection with the sphere of philosophy and science, which according to the authors are deeply determined by the market society. And second, the connection with the phenomenon of fascism, which we find throughout the book and also in the immediate context of the quoted sentences. The repression of the individual by the fascist states is not the opposite of liberal egalitarianism, but the uh, radicalization of its repressive aspect. The authors call fascism, yeah, as I said, the triumph of repressive equality. At first sight, this may seem absurd. Isn't fascism deeply hierarchical and racist? Isn't it very far from every thought of equality? But what Horkheim and Adorno are speaking about is the constraint to conformity. While liberal capitalist societies punish unconformity by the dull compulsion of economic relations, as Marx said, fascism punishes unconformity, especially unwillingness or disability to work, with direct force. The second text I would like to deal with here stems from the Minima Moralia. It is called Melange. In this text, Adorno criticizes the call for equality and tolerance. The familiar, familiar argument of tolerance that all people and all races are equal is a boomerang, he says. Adorno raises the point that the argument of equality does not serve emancipatory purposes. It names, he names several reasons for this. First, equality is, he says, refuted by the census. People do not seem equal. Secondly, racism generally is not open for anthropological debates. He says, the totalitarians know full well whom they do and whom they do not intend to murder. So, as I read Adorno, he advises the political left not to engage in discussions about the biological variety of the human race. I completely agree with Adorno about that. It would be rather misleading if we grounded our political aims on biological or anthropological insights into the nature of man. As sociolo sociologists or philosophers, we should leave open how far natural differences among humans reach. Then Adorno rejects equality as an ideal too. In his eyes, the ideal of equality coincides with the social tendencies he criticizes. It is demanded by capitalist society that all people become equal. Differences are in risk of being considered and treated as stigmata by society, as signs of social failure. 
quotation, an emancipated society would not be a state marked by unity, but the realization of the general and the reconciliation of the differences. We should not propagate abstract equality because thereby we just support the bad and repressive equality under capitalism. Instead, we should criticize re the repressive equality the society demands. The utopian society should be thought as a society in which one can be different without fear. Historically or biographically, Adorno's criticism of equality may have been inspired by Nietzsche. Nietzsche denies the idea of equality as deriving from the spirit of resentment, while real human greatness must be based on the domination of some kind of master race. But Adorno's attitude, I think, differs essentially from Nietzsche's racism, as well as from other conservative or reactionary criticisms of equality. Adorno doesn't stop at the idea of difference, but demands a difference reconciled with the common. A society in which everybody can be as he or she is without giving up social solidarity and unity. Adorno demands this for everybody, not just for some elected few, as Nietzsche does. So in Adorno, the idea of a difference is united with an idea of a harmonious society to which everybody, equally, has a right to. So even if we find many skeptical statements about equality, I think that Horkheim and Adorno do not reject the traditional leftist appreciation of the achievements of the bourgeois epoch. This becomes clear, for example, when they speak about the blessing that the market does not, does not ask about birth, that the market does not ask about birth, as I quoted before. But the emancipation of the individual in a non-repressive society, its reconciliation with the community without repressing others, is a basic and remaining element of Adorno's philosophy, even if the call for emancipation stays rather theoretic. The Frankfurt School's critique of equality is recognizable as an utopian one, in so far as it is linked to a critique of capitalist society and to the perspective of a liberated society in which the individual develops without having to serve profit. Adorno and Horkheimer do not reject equality in favor of social domination, but they criticize special kinds of equality as an instrument of such domination. This critique is to be seen in the context of the critique of individualism, especially in the negative dialectics. Adorno deceives contemporary individualism as a, as a seeming individualism, as a pseudo-individualism. And this is, seems to me to be completely valid, valid also today. The individual is courted um, with a goal to subject it. Ideology keeps telling that only the individual matters. General tendencies which determine the individual are denied or ignored. The egalitarianism of our society is part of this false individualism. To sum up, let me first turn back to equality as an anthropological fact, biological equality. Left-wing politics seems to presuppose that all members of humankind are equal. In its abstractness, this presupposition is not defendable. Equality and inequality are very general categories. They have to be conceived in their inter interdependence and located in their specific context. People may be equal in certain respects, but they will differ in others, or even in the same respect. For instance, all humans have the capacity of reason, but this capaci capacity is developed in a very manifold, differing way. It will be a basic conviction of enlightened theory and every emancipatory movement that the differences between human beings are not as big 
as some conservative thinkers thought, like Plato and Aristotle, for example, who said that uh, some were destined by nature to lead and to dominate the others. So I think we could exclude such an opinion. But within that limit, we should admit and respect all the differences in the world. The belief that a considerable part of the philosoph philosophical tradition shares, for example, ancient Stoicism and Christianity do so, the belief that all men and women are essentially equal concerning the essence, namely the soul, is a claim with very strong metaphysical and theological um, background. It is completely opposed to a scientific and materialist viewpoint. This belief is certainly not necessary for criticizing social domination. Now let's turn to equality as an ideal. Unlike Harry G. Frankfurt, maybe you've read his new little book about inequality. So unlike him, I think that on a very general level, the conviction um, of an equality of all people, of a normative equality of all people, concerning the dignity or worth, is the necessary basis of any emancipatory politics. On a more concrete level, of course, there are different kinds of equality which are leg legitimate goals of a liberal or emancipatory politics, like equality before law, equal access to health care, and equal educational opportunities. Maybe Marx and certainly Adorno neglected the liberating potential of these aspects of equality. But surely both showed us the limits of these instruments. It is hard to see how these political goals would ever transcend the present economic system. All to the contrary, equality can function as a fetish. We try to establish more and more equality in some limited spheres of society. We fight against the discrimination of some irrelevant minority um, while we do not question society at all. A certain equality of access to society's wealth will be a precondition of emancipation in capitalism as well as in a post-capitalist society. However, equality is not a goal in itself. It cannot be the goal to create a society as equal as possible. Finally, equality can even function as a means of repression. E applying the same standard to everybody is a means of extending competition and abolishing individuality. We could find examples for that in the field of education and the role of equal standards in it. Education is situated between society's requirements and the development of the individual. In the educational reforms of the recent years, I can hardly notice any trace of respect for individuality. Fulfilling the requirements of society and especially of business seems to be more and more the only goal of school and university education. A post-capitalist society should not be marked by material equality of all people, but by variety and diversity without domination, as Adorno outlined. In itself, equality is not a better ideal for critics of capitalist society than inequality. Inequality is a problem only insofar as it constitutes privilege and social domination, but that's not always the case, according to me. So if some leftists or liberals suspect every kind of variety to constitute privilege, I think that's misleading. That's why Marx did not demand the same for everybody, but everybody according to his needs. A post-capitalist society will probably be more equal in some sense. There should be smaller differences of access to social wealth. But it will be less equal in another sense. The individuals will face less coercion to conformity. A post-capitalist society will have to realize the freedom of the individual, which in the present society exists only in a limited and ideological form. Thank you very much. <laughs>